Welcome back. Today on the show, we have a real treat. We have Dr. Rupert Sheldrake, who has joined us to discuss all sorts of ideas, as usual, um, starting with his conception of how science could be improved in the future, how scientific dialogues could be more productive, and, of course, morphic resonance and his idea of the morphogenic fields. It's a real lesson in humility and persistence because uh, Dr. Sheldrake has been working on these ideas for a long time, since the, since the 70s, maybe even earlier. And many people that we run into on the show are also working outside of what you would call consensus science. And there's often a sense of bitterness and frustration. And that is not at all the case with Dr. Sheldrake. He has a calmness and an equanimity about the difficulty of his task that for us as people who are working on the very edges of human knowledge is incredibly inspiring because it's a hard road to hoe. There's many, many people who are perfectly content to let the system go as it is and to have a, to have a vision of what it can look like to work towards changing the paradigms and shifting the way that we see the world in such a peaceful way is incredibly useful to me and hopefully will be incredibly useful to you as well as you go forth in the world. Yeah, if you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did, please share it with somebody. It seems like the way for us to get better and better guests to come on the show and have conversations is by growing the channel. For whatever reason, that's just the metric people look at. So share it with somebody, post it wherever you do that. Um, if you've already done that, consider coming over to our Patreon. Uh, for really just a couple dollars a month, you could get involved in steering the ship and really helping us decide how to make it better in the future. And we have a really tight-knit relationship with our patrons. Thank you guys if, for our patrons that are listening. And yeah, with that, enjoy the conversation, and we'll see you guys next time. The scientific revolution starts now. One thing that's really fascinating is like when I read about your critics, like I was just looking at your Wikipedia page, and it seems like people are saying that. I mean, there's literally a quote here that's something to the effect of, um, it's pretty it's, outrageous. That your work is dangerous to the very endeavor of science. Yeah, it says, uh, popular attention paid to your work undermines the public's understanding of science. And I'm like, I don't think they understand that you're, that you're proposing a whole new vision of science, actually. And so mm -hmm. I was really hoping that you could um, tell us a little bit about your new vision for, for Science 2.0, what, what the the reboot, because you get into it at the end of the book a bit, but um, that's something that really excites us because we, we're trying, like we do this podcast, but we imagine building an institution where we can do granting and we have a nonprofit wing eventually where we can actually fund uh, science that might not have a place inside the academy. And I think that's one road to a better scientific future, but what are some of your other ideas? Well, I've got, it's hard to know where to start. Um, I've just been giving a course, an online course called Six Potential Breakthroughs in the Sciences, where I've identified six particular areas where I think the understanding is very poor indeed at the moment, and where relatively simple and inexpensive research could lead to breakthroughs. And I think we desperately need this. Um, I don't know if you saw in Nature this week, there's an uh, editorial uh, which follows up on a paper in Nature the previous week about the declining uh, proportion of breakthroughs and in innovative research in the sciences. Basically, the present scientific system is designed to give small incremental improvements along established lines. And um, it's uh, despite ever greater expenditure and more and more people working in it, it's become less and less creative. There are very, very few radically new discoveries or breakthroughs within the sciences. You know, there's plenty of sort of extra proteins being sequenced or extra genomes being sequenced and so forth. But um, there's very little that's radically new. So um, <clears throat> I spend a lot of time thinking about what to do about this. I mean, I've been trying to work towards a broadening of the scientific worldview 
well, for years, you know, more than 40 years. Um, and so perhaps I should start with how I see the new scientific worldview, the big picture. And then, if you like, I could talk about some of the more detailed areas of investigation. Yeah. But um, the big picture, I think, first of all, I think the mechanistic materialist worldview, which says everything's unconscious machinery, animals are just unconscious machines, brains are just computers, and so forth. Um, that is the old paradigm. It, it's, as it were, the uh, pre-Copernican scientific paradigm. It's, it's what dominates all research in all branches of science. Um, I think that what we're shifting into is a worldview of nature being alive rather than dead and mechanical, the universe being more like a developing organism than a machine, uh, the laws of nature more like habits that change and evolve rather than the whole universe governed by fixed laws like a cosmic Napoleonic code established at the moment of the Big Bang for no known reason. Um, and um, I think that the mind or consciousness may be present to some degree in all self-organizing systems. This is a kind of panpsychism. Um, and I think minds are not confined to the insides of heads. Um, it's not just, the mind is not just a kind of epiphenomenon uh, generated by brain activity that's all inside the head that doesn't actually do anything. That's the official worldview. Um, but rather, Minds are extended beyond brains, um, just like fields are extended beyond the Earth. The Earth's gravitational field extends invisibly far beyond the Earth. Um, the field of a magnet extends far beyond a magnet. Uh, the field of a mobile phone beyond the mobile phone. And I think the fields of our minds extend far beyond our brains and bodies. Um, so those are some of the ingredients in what I think of as a um, a, a worldview uh, which we're moving towards. Um, but, uh, and there are many people who think along these lines now, but typically, um, if they work within institutional science, they'll keep these opinions to themselves, at least during working hours, because otherwise it would endanger their career. Um, so I, I think that the whole culture is shifting in this direction. But institutional science has just got locked into this old world view, um, which I and you are trying to do something about to help accelerate a change. Do, do you mind if I ask you where you think that the preeminence of physics in the scientific landscape came from? Or do you even believe that's a thing? Like, obviously, physicists believe that they have the final say. And to some extent, when we were working with biologists, we got the impression that the biologists would often kick the final say down to the physicists, especially when you get into questions about uh, electrochemistry, just electricity in general. There, you know, everybody kind of is pushing towards the physicists, and I think the physicists feel they inhabit this uh, supreme authority in these discussions. Where, where did that come? Do you have a sense of where that came from? Well, I think it partly comes from the 17th century origins of modern mechanistic science, which was dominated by physicists, Galileo, Kepler, Newton, Descartes, uh, mathematicians and physicists. Um, and I think it comes from the, the ideology of science in the 17th century, where most scientists were Christians, um, but with their mechanistic worldview, um, they thought of the universe as a machine that operated more or less automatically, and God as a kind of machine maker outside the universe who designed the machinery and pressed the start button. Um, and because the way the universe worked in their, in their thinking was through mathematical laws, the laws of nature were essentially mathematical, then the people best equipped to understand the fundamental nature of reality were physicists, because they understood maths mm -hmm. and other people like biologists and chemists and geologists and so on didn't understand very much maths. So this put them in the role of being the high priests of the scientific endeavor. 
a role to which they cling uh, to this day, as you pointed out, um, and think of themselves as the ultimate arbiters. It's partly not just them, but you see biologists in mechanistic biology, the aim of mechanistic biology as expressed in the 19th century by T.H. Huxley, Darwin's bulldog, um, the aim of mechanistic biology was, was to reduce the phenomena of life to chemistry and physics, um, because then they'd be explained in terms of proper science, instead of having ideas of vital factors, minds, mysterious forces, uh, etc. Um, that would mean that they were on the solid mechanistic materialist ground of physics. Um, so biologists played along with this, and, and of course it was very flattering for physicists. Um, but of course, right to, today, we're in a very different situation. In my opinion, physics is stuck. Um, they've, they, they're completely stuck. They've got into, they've got a theoretical scheme, um, string, super string or M theory with 10 or 11 dimensions, which predicts the existence of 10 to the 500 universes and doesn't tell us anything very specific about our own, um, and makes no testable predictions. Um, they can only uh, understand how the universe works in terms of postulating unobserved dark matter and dark energy, which are now supposed to make up 95% of the cosmos, uh, material which by definition we know nothing about. So it, they, they, what they're saying is basically 95% of nature is utterly unknown to us, um, but it must be uh, dark matter and dark energy um, uh, and we don't yet haven't yet figured out what they are. Um, and then, uh, in order to account for the laws of nature being as they are, assuming they were all there at the moment of the Big Bang, they many of them postulate that they're not fine-tuned for life or for human appearance or evolution. Uh, we just happen to live in the only universe that's suitable for us. But there are billions, trillions of actually existing universe is parallel to our own, the multiverse, again, completely untestable. So what we've got is a theoretical physics, which is now navel gazing, uh, coming up with untestable theories, with very little to say really about the nature of life and mind. Mm -hmm. um, in my view, I mean, uh, the, the I think the most exciting parts of physics are not the bits we read about in all these books about problems of quantum theory and the multiverse and so forth. I think the most exciting and innovative parts of physics are in solid state physics and um, and uh, you know materials uh, materials science because there's really interesting innovative research going on in those areas which is empirically driven not theory driven mm -hmm. and that's why it's exciting because it actually is in contact with reality. Yeah, I feel like the next century, the whole world of material atomics has yet to be developed. You know, they're so schematized the way that we think about things on a tiny level. I really look forward to that. There's one point in your book, you, you make this really astute observation that most people are taught science is this iterative process of testing hypotheses and basically a laboratory-oriented situation. But there's so many of these big topics like cosmology and even basic astrophysics where you can't do experiments in the lab or say the deep past, like looking into the geological record. So much of science is completely inaccessible to experimentation. And I, I wonder how that understanding can be repaired in the future or, or how you incorporate this kind of work into the old paradigm about experimentation if if do you believe like experimentation isn't inherently part of science in the in the future or or what it what is its role mm. oh i'm very much an empiricist i mean i've spent my whole career doing experimental research i love doing experiments and um you know i'm doing i'm i've got experiments going on right now um and uh, so i i think science has to be empirical to maintain contact with reality um now there are certain areas of science where it's not possible to do experiments you can't do an experiment on a distant star moving it around within its galaxy to see how it behaves astronomy is essentially observational science but it's still empirical you're still making observations of stars and galaxies um 
And, uh, you know, geology is an observational science. You can't really do experiments on sort of run a new ice age in the laboratory to see how it pans out. Um, and evolutionary history is, you know, empirical because it's based on fossils and so forth, uh, but it's not experimental. So I think that the key word here is empirical rather than mm. experimental. You can be empirical without being experimental. Um, but I think we have to be empirical if we're not going to be carried away with pure, I mean, like super string theory or something, which is seems to be entirely theoretical, or the multiverse theory, uh, with not uh, with no point of contact with empirical reality. Mm. Mm. There's something about the last century of science that, to me, seems like an attempt to squeeze the divine out of science, where there was it became very fashionable to be agnostic or atheistic and to reduce the world of science to something that had no place for spirit and had no no room for anything except for the physical and yet these new theories to me especially cosmological ones seem foundationally very religious and it's a new religion right because if you look at something like max tegmark's world which is our mathematical universe at the basis, he proposes that we live in a computer program, right? Because that's that's the final that's the final interpretation of that. And so, living in a technological age where people are hard at work developing these super sentient computer programs, it seems like we are painting a new god, which is uh, the hologram, so to speak. Oh, the ultimate computer programmer. Um, yes. Um, well, I think I think a lot of atheism is just bad theology, actually. <laughs> um, and, and uh, you know, atheists, um, for example, Lawrence Krauss, the atheistic friend of, of cosmologist, friend of Richard Dawkins, uh, wrote a book called A Universe from Nothing, mm. uh, showing you don't need God because the whole universe could appear from nothing. Okay, well, what does he mean by nothing? Well, first of all, he says, there are the laws of nature. That's what governs the universe. He takes those for granted. They're already there. And then he has the cosmic, um, you know, the dark matter, the cosmic uh, vacuum field, not dark matter, the cosmic vacuum field, which can have, which is full of energy. And a small spontaneous fluctuation in that can give rise to the universe governed by the universal laws. Well, that's not really a universe from nothing. What it is, is a bad form of Trinitarian theology. Um, Trinitarian theology in the Christian tradition uh, says that there's a ground of all being as God the Father. There's a logos, or the second person of the Trinity, which is the principle of form and order, a bit like Platonic ideas. And there's the Holy Spirit, which is the principle of energy, movement, and change. So... Um, the laws of nature are really an aspect of the logos, and the, en the energy that comes from this vacuum field is the principle of movement and change. So you've got the, the second part of the logos and the Holy Spirit, and all he's done is deleted the ground of both of them, saying uh, it's nothing, and they spontaneously exist. Um, and uh, so it's a very, very limited and peculiar form of atheism. Um, so I don't think that um, most most atheist thinkers, first of all, take a peculiar form of cosmology, the 17th century form, as their starting point, uh, which is that the universe is a machine and the it's made by a machine-making God who's external to it, and the machine goes on automatically. And if God does anything, having made the machine, uh, then he can only intervene by suspending the laws of nature in the occasional miracle in a way that's completely incredible. And so the view of God that they're busy refuting or ignoring or um, denying is a view of God that most religious people have never had in the first place. Most religious people think that God's a form of consciousness that pervades the universe, not being external to it, that present in conscious beings and indeed in space and time, and um, is reflected in our own minds, and our own minds can communicate directly with that 
conscious being. Uh, that's the more, much more normal religious view. And um, most atheists aren't addressing that at all. What, how they've got to where they are, historically speaking, seems to me fairly simple. In the 17th century, there's a, a dualistic separation of God and nature, mind and matter, mind and body, um, and people and animals, because animals are just machines. Mm. And people have a mind inside the mechanical brain, but uh, that's the logical, rational mind that science happens with. Um, so in the 17th century, that dualism, Cartesian dualism, um, separated mechanical nature from a supernatural world of God, angels, and human intellects, mm. which were non-physical outside space and time, whereas science dealt with that which is physical inside space and time. And one advantage of that dualism at the time was that it kept religion and science out of each other's hair because scientists got the whole universe, including the stars and bodies and animals and plants, uh, to do with what they liked and um, with leaving God out of the picture because it's all automatic. And religious people got God, angels, and human minds, and morality, uh, but uh, withdrew the realm of religion from science. So it all became about humans and God and sin and so forth, and withdrawn withdrawn from nature. Um, now, in the in the nineteenth century, um, you the movement towards materialism in science said no. Instead of two things, matter and spirit, there's just one thing matter and there's no such thing as God and angels uh, and the human mind isn't something different from matter it is matter it's nothing but the activity of the brain located inside the head and so that the so the form of atheism we're most familiar with today is a kind of collapsed form of Cartesian dualism eliminating the spirit pole but to understand where it all went wrong, I think one has to go back before the 17th century and see that, at least in European thought, um, the splitting of consciousness and matter and mind and nature was not how people thought of it. In the Middle Ages in Europe, um, you know, the general theological view was that nature's alive, the earth is alive, the stars and planets are conscious being beings, animals have souls the word animal comes from anima meaning soul and um uh, it was a living universe it was a kind of christian animism that was the driving force that gave rise to the great gothic, gothic cathedrals uh, nothing like the um the view that atheists have of the religious world today so i think there's a tremendous amount of confusion that's arisen uh, through this historical process um do you think that psychology was some sort of attempt to reintegrate these spiritual phenomena back into science to somehow subsume the, the spiritual elements? Well, not psychology. I mean, if you look at 20th century psychology, I mean, William James may be, uh, if you look at the founder of American psychology, um, you know, he's a brilliant visionary. But that didn't last long. And, you know, by the 1920s, uh, the, the behaviorist school had taken over B.F. Skinner and Watson, his follower. Um, uh, Watson and Skinner, between them, had the view that psychology should just be about measuring behavior, muscular movements and glandular secretions. Um, and the very word consciousness shouldn't be used at all in psychology. Uh, only measurable, objectively verifiable facts counted. And their aim was, in fact, to eliminate subjective experience completely. Um, and so that was certainly not very illuminating. Now, of course, you, th within psychotherapy, um, mm. that then you had movements of people like Jung, who did try to integrate the realm of spirit into psychology. And I think what's happened in the last 25 years, which has been a much healthier development, is consciousness studies, which is the scientific study of consciousness, not within the narrow framework of old style behaviorist psychology, which then moved on to cognitive psychology with the computer, the brain as a computer model. Uh, but consciousness studies say, okay, well, let's look at what actually happens to people's consciousness in near death experiences, psychedelic experiences, out of the body experiences, dreams, lucid dreams, 
um, you know, various altered states of consciousness. Uh, let's actually look at consciousness itself scientifically. And when you do that, then you see that there are, um, you know, there are all sorts of things going on in consciousness that have no immediate explanation in terms of synapses or neurotransmitters. Obviously, it all has to be related somehow to the brain, but the very narrow focus of cognitive behavioral psychology and cognitive psychology, um, and, uh, you, uh, and, and then leading to artificial intelligence theories, um, based on cognitive psychology and the brain as a computer has had a very narrowing effect on the sciences. But as I say, I think consciousness studies is a field of science which is opening this all up in a, in a much more exciting and interesting way. Did, I'm always, I was kind of struck in, in, in looking at your work how similar the concept of extended intergenerational memory is to Jung's basic premise of uh, archetypes and the collective consciousness. Do you see your work as in that tradition or do you are you imagining something wholly different with your with your morphic resonance ideas? The idea of morphic resonance is basically that there's a kind of memory in nature. All self-organizing systems, molecules, crystals, cells, tissues, organisms, societies of organisms, galaxies, um, all self-organizing systems at all levels have a kind of memory from past similar systems that's transmitted across time by a kind of resonance across time. That's what I call morphic resonance. And so this leads to the idea that each species has a kind of collective memory of form and of instinct. And in that sense, it's very similar to Jung's idea of the collective unconscious, which is a collective human memory. Um, so in, in that sense, it's very similar. I didn't arrive at this through studying Jung. I came to the idea of morphic resonance when I was working in Cambridge, where I worked as a, I was a research fellow of the Royal Society and a fellow of Clare College in Cambridge University. Um, and I was working on plant development, plant morphogenesis, how leaves take up their form, how plants grow. Um, and I and my colleagues were at the leading edge of um, a mechanistic understanding of plant growth, plant hormones. Uh, there's a hormone called auxin. I worked out how it's formed in plants. And with a colleague, I worked out how it's transported in a, what's called the polar auxin transport system. Um, uh, we were way ahead of anyone working in animal development. We knew the key molecules. We knew how they were moved around, etc. But... I then realized that this just wasn't enough because all plants have the same hormone and the same transport system, and yet a fern leaf is very different from a hollyhock leaf or a beech leaf. Um, and uh, the, these hormones alone can't explain the form. Then I got interested in um, a well-established concept in developmental biology, morphogenetic fields, which are form-shaping fields first proposed in the 1920s, uh, the idea that there's an invisible field that shapes a developing organism as it grows. Each cell has its own kind of field. Each tissue has a field. There's a nested hierarchy of um, form-shaping fields. Um, and this the, wasn't and these, my idea. Hmm? And, the, and these have actually held up pretty well because now there's a molecular model which is uh, carbon dioxide gradients, electrical gradients, and over time this has just become more more settled as a true phenomenon. Yeah, like Michael Levin's work, I'm sure you're aware of, seems to play right into this paradigm. Oh yes, Michael Levin is, is I know Levin, Levin, and his work is probably, he's the best modern representative of this point of view. Um, and so basically it's a top-down system of explanation. A field gives you a top-down way of explaining things. It's like if you want to explain the universe in terms of gravitational fields, which physicists do, it's a top-down theory. The field explains how planets and stars interact. You don't start with individual atoms and try and build up the universe from atoms. And with the electromagnetic fields, with the field of a magnet, you start with the whole field has a pattern and a shape. 
And the idea was that this top-down approach in biology is necessary as well as a bottom-up molecular type approach. And Michael Levin shows how uh, morphogenetic fields uh, could be expressed through electrical fields, electric gradients, and so forth. Uh, I think he's doing very, very good work on, on uh, morphogenetic fields, and he speaks very persuasively about the need for this top-down explanation. Well, I became persuaded of all this, you know, when I was doing research in Cambridge, I was reading about morphogenetic fields, which was a very unfashionable topic in the 1970s. Um, and thinking about them, and I thought, okay, well, if morphogenetic fields, whatever they are, or however they work, are shaping organisms, how can they possibly be inherited? Um, and they couldn't be inherited through the genes, because Genes, by definition, are not coding for structures or forms. They're coding for the sequence of amino acids and proteins or for the activation or deactivation of other genes. So uh, there's, I, could, I thought genes were grossly overrated and that they couldn't explain all of inheritance. Um, and so the forms, the morphogenetic fields, had to be inherited in some other way. And I grappled with this for about a year, and I just couldn't think how it would happen. Then I read a book called Matter and Memory by the French philosopher Henry Bergson, Henri Bergson, um, which was first published in French in 1896. And Bergson argued there that memories, our own memories, are not stored in brains, but there's a form of causation that works directly across time. And then I realized that the philosopher Whitehead had had something similar, and Bertrand Russell had talked in terms of monemic mem uh, causation, memory causation. But actually, there was a whole tradition in philosophy of another way, another kind of causation across time. And it had to be based on similarity. And that led me to, in a sudden flash, I had this idea of morphic resonance. And uh, and then the more I thought about it, the more it seemed to be capable of explaining. Because, you see, I think that without morphic resonance, morphogenetic fields are very hard to explain. It's very hard to explain their inheritance. You have to say, I mean, I don't know where Michael Levin stands on this. He's well aware of morphic resonance. He's read my books on the subject. Um, um, but... Um, well, we will definitely, he's coming back to the show uh, in a couple of months, so we will definitely ask him when we see him. But yeah, he's a, he's a very, very kind man and very thoughtful, and I, I love talking to him. He's he's one of my favorite oh, He's guests. great. He's great. I think I think he wouldn't probably want to commit himself to morphic resonance, partly because it would land him in a lot of trouble, um, <laughs> and, and, and partly because, you know, he'd want to see more evidence, and right now, it's very hard to get the experiments done. So there is some evidence, but there's very few people in the world working on this. And um, because it, you can't get grants, you'll lose your job, etc. cetera. Um, there's one experiment going on at a university in the US I can't name. Um, and the person doing the research who's a postdoc has to do it at night when there's no one around because he fears he'll lose his job if anyone discovers he's doing research on more what experiments. Are what are the what are the experiments? Can you can you describe in broad strokes what that would look like? Yes, um, according to morphic resonance, if an animal learns a new trick, um, say rats learn a new trick in New York, then rats all around the world in London, Melbourne, Australia, etc., should learn the same trick more easily just because they've learned that new trick. If lots of people do the word puzzle wordle this morning. Um, when it's just been issued, it might be harder for them to solve it than people who are doing it this evening when millions of other people have done that same puzzle. So these are all predictions of morphic resonance theory. I've tried to get my hands on the Wordle data, but the New York Times now own Wordle and they're terrible spoil sports and, <laughs> and, and, and say we are not interested in investigating this at this time. You know, they, they just, again, I suppose they prefer an easy life. If, if someone said the New York Times is doing morphic resonance research with their word puzzle, you know, that would be big problems for the games department and they just want an easy life. Um, but anyway, 
the, it, it's a theory that would apply to all animal learning, including human learning, and is potentially very easy to test, like with Wordle, because there's a replicate experiment every single day. Um, but in this particular case, the, somebody's doing experiments with the nematode worm Cenorhabditis elegans, which is one of the main model organisms in uh, biological research. And with nematode worms, it's possible to train them to be attracted to certain chemicals. If you flavor their food with a chemical like benzaldehyde, which they wouldn't normally encounter in a pure form anyway, um, <coughs> you can train them, you know, a bit like Pavlovian conditioning, to be attracted to, uh, they go towards benzaldehyde because that means food. And if you do this over several generations, um, they go on doing it um, just without, you, you don't have to select them, it, it just gets sort of built in. And this is called epigenetic inheritance, the inheritance of acquired characters, which used to be a big taboo in the 20th century in biology. In fact, it was probably the biggest taboo. But now it's been rebranded epigenetic inheritance. It's a major topic of research, as you know, within biology. Um, well, the uh, the experiment I'm talking about is is conditioning nematode worms to be attracted to food with a particular attractant, so they get used to that. Doing this for quite a number of generations, so they become more and more attracted to it, which could be an epigenetic effect. There could be molecular changes and so forth. Um, but then, then comparing control worms whose ancestors have never been exposed to it and see whether they've got more attracted to this chemical um, because the others have learned um, than they would have done otherwise. In other words, does this spread to other worms? In experiments with rats, it's already been shown that rats that learn to escape from a water maze get over the generations get quicker and quicker but uh, it's not just rats whose parents have learned it's not just a molecular epigenetic effect rats whose parents have never learned of the same breed also learn it quicker when the others have learned it so i would expect that the same kind of experiment could be done with nematode worms um, the difference is that with rat experiments they take months or years whereas nematode worm experiments could be done in in a, a few weeks or months so uh, it's it's also a much more convenient model organism and it would be very good to have a morphic resonance experiment at the very heart of contemporary biology using one of the morphic one of the model organisms uh, and similar experiments could be done with fruit flies or, or other model organisms yeah or bacteria even they replicate so quickly that would maybe be a very fast way to get at it. I'm beginning to see why people suggest that your work is dangerous to the heart of science because <laughs> this undermines this would uh, this would undermine pretty much everything from from the way that I see it because if all of a sudden one lab in you know Omaha, Nebraska is doing work that is affecting the laboratory in Cambridge there's almost no way to be able to tease that apart and it casts doubt on the entire endeavor of being able to say that these experiments are randomized and objective and somehow unconnected from everything else that's happening. And that's a very, I think that a lot of the times the immune system of science is there to protect the enterprise in the way that we currently see it, which is this objective... <coughs> the test tube was filled, the experiment was run sort of perspective. And the minute that you remove objectivity, the entire edifice suddenly stands on much more fragile ground. Yes, well, it's on fragile ground anyway, isn't it? Because the replication <laughs> crisis in science has shown that the great majority of papers in many fields of science, even in top the most prestigious peer-reviewed journals, cannot be replicated. So... It's not as if uh, science at the moment is this totally firm edifice. It's it's not. It's crumbling. The, the so-called objectivity of science is crumbling. More and more cases of fraud come to light. Um, more, um, and um, more and more cases of paper factories where people pay, you know, generate papers to get promoted and stuff. Um, and the, the, the replication crisis... Um, 
is a very serious crisis. And so it's not as if um, everything's fine the way it is. It isn't. Um, and I think that if we understood more about the possible morphic resonance effects um, from lab to lab and from experiment to experiment, it could make science more repeatable, not less so. Uh, right now, it's assumed that there's no influence whatever. From If you do the same experiment over and over again, then according to morphic resonance, if you're dealing with a new phenomenon, uh, the, the worms might learn faster or something like that uh, if you keep doing the same experiment. But right now, people don't pay attention to this. If they notice things are getting easier as time goes on, which they do, they assume they're just getting better at doing the experiments. For example, in chemistry, um, it's been known for a very long time that as when one lab's been able to crystallize a new compound, it gets easier for labs all around the world. And chemists assume that this is happening because fragments of the crystals are being wafted around the world in the atmosphere or carried from lab to lab on the beards or clothing of migrant chemists. Um, that's the standard <laughs> explanation uh, for what everyone agrees is a well-known phenomenon. Um, melting points have been going up, uh, you know, um, where they're supposed to be constant. They don't go down on the whole, they go up. And um, I think that's because morphic resonance so stabilizes crystal structures of new compounds and they become harder to dis disrupt and therefore the melting points go up but chemists say yes melting points do tend to go up but that's just because impurities reduce the melting point and chemists get better at making the chemicals um, and they're more pure and I said, well, how do you know they're more pure? They said, well, they must be more pure. They've got a higher melting point. So um, the, it, it's very, very hard to argue with people who actually do observe these changes because instead of thinking it's happening in nature, they think it's just happening because of the way the scientists themselves are learning, which, of course, may well play a major part. That's why one needs special experiments to tease apart learning effects of scientists from changes in nature herself you mentioned this uh when you were talking about the new york times uh wordles you brought up this concept of essentially heresy that we have and, and this is something that comes up over and over again which is that it's increasingly it's an increasingly strangled discussion in mainstream science right there's a there's less innovation there's smaller smaller incremental adjustments that can be made and anything that's outside of that gets attacked rapidly by the scientific immune system do you imagine that science in the future um some our friend kurt mentioned he calls it uh science 2.0 but the future the, the new version of science is there a way that we can imagine encouraging open honest good faith discussions where people don't just have this allergic championship mind mentality about how discussions unfold? Well, it's not immediately obvious because science is not a culture of, uh, doesn't really have a culture of debate. You know, when Thomas Kuhn gave his model of scientific revolutions, uh, the structure of scientific revolutions, the idea of paradigms and that paradigm change, you get a new model. Actually, the, the thing, the kinds of revolutions he was thinking of were much more like old style South American revolutions where one military dictatorship takes over from another one to a palace revolution. They were not an opening of the whole science to democratic participation. And, you know, the, um, so they're not, the, the way scientific revolutions work isn't to lead to a pluralism. When you get a new, orthodoxy, like relativity theory, quantum theory, the Big Bang theory, which only came in in 1966. Till then, most physicists thought the universe was eternal. Um, when the new orthodoxy is in place, then it becomes another dictatorship. Um, we, I mean, we're used in every other aspect of our lives to pluralism. You know, you've got Democrats, you've got Republicans, you've got independents, and within religion, you've got Christians and Muslims and Buddhists, and among Christians, you've got Catholics and Protestants and Orthodox, and you've got lots of subdivisions within those. So, um, and in a court of law, you hear the prosecution and the defense. In almost every other area of our existence, we're used to a full and free debate or uh, the expression 
on the level playing field of different views. Within science, it's not how it works. You know, if you're going against the scientific orthodoxy, your papers will be rejected by anonymous peer reviewers from mainstream journals. You'll be cancelled or disinvited from giving talks in main universities. Um, you know, I know all these things. They happen to me all the time. Um, and um, the, the, there's, there's a kind of, as you say, an immune system, uh, which uh, prevents these things happening. Now, I think one way they could happen is through organizations outside the scientific institutions staging debates about open questions in science, uh, where there really is a, a difference of opinion. I think if I were running such a thing, I wouldn't include climate change or COVID because there's already hyperpolarized opinions there where you, you, you'll just have open warfare and it would be very hard to deal with that. But debates about our memories stored in the brain, is the mind confined to the inside of the head? Um, is there really a multiverse? Could the laws of nature be more like habits? Um, does dark matter really exist? Or could there be alternative theories to explain uh, the behavior of galaxies and so on? Such debates would help. Another thing that would help is funding agencies that are prepared to fund unorthodox research. And this is not going to happen through government funding agencies. The NSF and, and, and such organizations are going to be dominated in the future as they are now by committees of eminent scientists who've come up through this system and basically will have more of the same. Uh, but they can happen through um, foundations or independent funding agencies. And there are one or two have come into being recently. For example, you've probably come across the Emerald Gate Foundation in San Francisco, which is made up of people who've made fortunes in Silicon Valley. They've put in something like $100 million to fund unconventional research. And um, they're well aware, as you are, of the power of the immune system and the fact that it inhibits genuine innovation and they want to be able to fund truly innovative research um so uh, i'm not sure how much they're funding oh they only started recently but if more of these foundations or some of the many billionaires that now exist in the world who are interested in science and some of them really are interested in science saw that they could make get a much bigger bang for the buck by funding by funding unconventional research than than having a building named after them at Harvard or Stanford or somewhere um you know for the, for for fewer millions of dollars uh, they could actually make a bigger difference then i think uh, things could change because right now most scientists won't do unconventional research because they're afraid of losing their job, their grants, their pension, etc. Um, I mean, I'm not like that because I lost all these things so long ago. I've got nothing further to lose. So I feel extraordinarily free. Um, and I have actually been fortunate enough to be supported by eccentric millionaires over the years um, who like what I'm doing and, and support it on a, on a modest scale. Um, I do research that's really quite inexpensive. So I'm not talking lots and lots of money. Yeah, it's, so so are we. We're supported by by independent people. It's interesting. I'm hearing almost an, a, a vision of separation of state and science in some sense. I mean, obviously, state technological engineering based science is going to be a thing forever as long as states want to have militaries and industry and all of this stuff. But it's interesting that this comes back to a sort of privatization of science at, at the end of the day. And it also strikes me that states are fundamentally interested in science being a discipline of truth seeking, truth with a capital T, that is really mixed up in all Monolithic. of this. Monolithic. Yeah, where the state needs to be able to say that this is objectively the correct move and we will go in this direction because this is the final say. And the minute that you start mucking about in that and start suggesting that, well, perhaps that's not, that's not the case and there's a pluralism, it again it can't be supported by an edifice that needs to have a final truth. 
Well, the state, I mean, there's been no separation of science and state for a long time. And when the first vision of science, organized science, was put forward by Francis Bacon at the beginning of the 17th century, he was Lord Chancellor of England. He was a major functionary in the state. And he had this vision of academies of science, which would be state supported, uh, like colleges of cardinals or bishops. And his vision led to the founding of the Royal Society and then national academies of science all over the world um, as state sponsored and state recognized bodies where you'd have the top high priesthood of science uh, under state control. Um, but this, in fact, was, um, although it was a kind of ideal that has been realized in the 20th and 21st centuries, um, for a lot of the history of science, it didn't apply. Um, in Britain, for example, in the 19th century, a great deal of research was done by independent researchers like Charles Darwin. He never had a government job or an academic post or a state grant. He was an independently wealthy gentleman. He married the pottery heiress, uh, the Wedgwood pottery heiress. He made a fortune on speculating in railway stocks in the 1860s when there was a kind of like the internet boom, there was a railway stock boom and then it collapsed. He sold just at time, in time to avoid losing every, everything. So Darwin funded his own research and was very, very independent. And if he'd had to have grant proposals approved by committees, I dare say the theory of evolution as we know it would have been much delayed. Um, and the same goes for the co-discoverer of the theory of evolution by natural selection, Alfred Russell Wallace who was working as an independent naturalist, collecting specimens in what we now call Indonesia, then the Dutch East Indies, collecting butterflies and so forth, and selling them to collectors. That's how he funded his expeditions. And he came up with the idea of evolution by natural selection. Um, so uh, quite a lot of the really innovative work in science was not done by people within state or state-funded institutions. And it's really only since the Second World War that the enormous dominance of state and institutional science has taken over and almost squeezed out all other forms of inquiry. But if we were having this conversation in the 1860s or 70s, you know, there would have been lots of examples of people who weren't working within state institutions. And I mean, in, including the great inventors, you know, Tesla, Marconi, and all those kind of people were not pro tenured professors at Harvard or anything. They, uh, a lot of the great innovations in radio, the telegraph, in uh, and so forth, um, didn't happen through state institutions. Some happened through private companies, and indeed, you know, there were famous examples, the Bell Labs and so on, which were great centers of innovation in the 20th century. Uh, but corporations have now become more dependent on government support. Government aid has become much more integrated. Um, and therefore, the scope for freedom has become even more diminished. Yeah. Well, there's another aspect to it as well, which is um, profitability and instrumentalization which if you are working on something like power generation in the case of Tesla there's a very clear there's a there's a very clear series of steps that gets you to a product that you can sell and that's appealing for investment in a modern sense because well that's what we do we put money into things that will make more money and that is the that's the holy grail and so with something like a morphogenic field or morphic resonance do you do you see it as something that is instrumentalizable, or do you see it as something that <coughs> will forever remain as a philosophical underpinning that simply changes how we see the world, but can't be used directionally? Well, I mean, morphic resonance—it is largely, you know, how nature works. I think, but. Um, I think you, it might be possible to, well, if it's easier to learn things others have learned before, then one way of instrumentalizing it would be to have morphic resonance educational techniques. I think all our education, when you learn something, I think it is facilitated by morphic resonance from those who've learned it before. 
And if one found ways of optimizing morphic resonance in education, you could probably have accelerated learning. That would be one fairly simple uh, example. Um, um, then, if it's possible to create artificially systems which have a holistic, a genuinely holistic property, um, for example, if it's possible to make fairly complex analog computers that have uh, patterns within them, that are holistic patterns within them, um, that are capable of morphic resonance, then one could have a whole computer system based on analog, not digital computers, which would have a built-in global memory. And I'm sure there'd be uses for that. Um, the thing is, digital computers deliberately exclude both chance and anything remotely like morphic resonance. They're highly deterministic mm. um, and are never going to come to life or have genuine artificial intelligence, in my opinion, whereas analog computers are much more likely candidates for this. And yet that's not where the money is going at the moment. So mm. I would, um, I think it would lead to possible new investment in forms of analog computing. And in relation to um, some, we haven't talked about my research on so-called psychic phenomena, but one of mm -hmm. them is presentiment, feeling the future. Um, there's quite a lot of evidence that people can feel what's going to happen in the next few seconds. And um, I think that feeling what's going to happen is actually a commonplace experience. I think that I've done surveys that show that about 95% of people have had the experience of waking up before an alarm goes off. And most people just assume they've got some kind of biological clock that enables them to do this. That's just an assumption because that's the obvious mechanistic explanation. But if you think about it in evolutionary terms, um, no one had to wake up at a precise time to catch a plane or a train or something till the 20th century or the 19th century. Most people didn't even have watches you know, or clocks. They woke up with a cock crow. And so the idea of this precise time that works when you're asleep and enables you to wake up at weird times in the morning to catch planes uh, is, in my opinion, highly unlikely. I think that it's a kind of presentiment of the alarm or even of the time when you wake up, because you can do it without the alarm, just tell yourself to wake at a certain time. Now, I think that people who are doing day trading in, in stock markets, uh, you know, where you're betting whether these, this futures is going to go up or down in the next, uh, this stock, so, say German government bond futures, is it going to go there in the next five seconds or is it going to go there? And you, the people who are doing day trading are often working on time scales of a few seconds. Um, and I've interviewed day traders in one of the most successful companies in the city of London. And the key day traders there are highly intuitive. They say, you know, I just know when news is going to break and look at the right screen. I just happen to know which of the 12 screens around my desk the action is going to be at. And so... I think day traders are doing this. And I think if one had a training app for day traders that cultivated the sense of, you know, wh where things are going to go next with this, by cultivating this feeling, this presentiment, um, then people could actually make millions out of it. And if, if you marketed an app, a presentiment app, which would enable people to make millions out of day trading, I think this would catch on very fast. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there might still be so-called skeptics who'd say, oh, it's impossible and stuff. But if people are making millions, then uh, for most people, that would be evidence enough that something's going on. And moreover, it would be something that computers wouldn't be able to simulate or catch up with. So mm. that was another idea. Um, I'm, it was one of the ideas I suggest in my course on, um, you know, six potential breakthroughs in the sciences. Um, because although personally, I'm not very interested in making millions on stock markets or day trading there are a lot of people who are interested and um as you say if, if there's an application for something people take it much more seriously hmm. yeah along the lines of computers um if you have time I would, I would love to hear your thoughts about the participation of artificial intelligence in morphogenic fields and if you think that these uh 
yeah, if you think that computers are capable of participating in conscious activity, if that's something that you see spreading outside of organic material or or how, how that's going to integrate in, in the future. Well, I don't think that, as I said just now, I don't think digital computers have that capacity. They're highly determinate. And, you know, and you want them to be. I mean, if you press an A on your keyboard, if you're writing something, you want A to come up on the screen. You don't want a sort of 50% probability <laughs> of A and sort of 30% of B and 15% of C or something. You don't want it to be probabilistic. You want it to be determinate. And even when people apply randomizing programs in computers, they usually use pseudo-random algorithms rather than real uh, randomness. And the reason I think this is important is that I think how morphogenetic fields work, and I think how morphic resonance works working through these fields, is by patterning indeterminate events that almost everything in nature is indeterminate, except computers and man-made machines. But if you think about it, atomic processes are indeterminate. That's quantum indeterminism or uncertainty. Um, um, the weather is indeterminate. It's a chaotic system. You know, the breaking of a wave in the ocean is indeterminate. Each wave is different from the last. If you look at the pattern of veins in a leaf on a tree, the pattern of veins is different on each leaf and moreover different on each half of the same leaf, the two sides of the same leaf. Um, nature is indeterminate inherently, and we've created little islands of determinism through our technologies because we want the car, you want the, when you press the accelerator, you want it to, to accelerate, you don't want it to break. Or no. So we, we've, we have created artificially determinate systems um, through technology, and then we've used those machines as the model for the whole of the universe, the machine theory of nature. It's, you couldn't think of a worse metaphor for most things in nature than a man-made machine. Um, so I think that computers, uh, with their deterministic programs and their granulated reductionistic plus and naught method of functioning, have no holistic overall pattern. The program gives a kind of overall pattern, but the actual working of the computer is granular. It's sort of, it's lots of little pluses and minuses. It's kind of atomistic. And, you know, the screens are pixelated. They're pixels. They're separate units. And uh, they're not holistic overview type things. Um, mm. And so I think intelligence is to do with holistic patterns and the recognition of holistic patterns and and the um computers in their present form are neither capable of being conscious nor truly intelligent mm. when you get something like deep mind which is very impressive in the way that they've managed to predict protein structures for example google's deep mind um how they do that is through a massive amount of feeding in data from thousands and thousands of different proteins and then you recognize similar patterns like the facial recognition software it's not because the software understands the nature of human faces or empathizes with the expressions on people's faces or understands how faces develop in embryology it's simply through comparing just millions and millions and millions of faces and and having a program that can pick out differences and and when you see the same one again you can recognize it but it's a completely unconscious process based on kind of brute force um so i personally think that the most speculative attempts to create artificial intelligence that is true intelligence are doomed to failure i mean mm -hmm. we heard this 30 years ago fifth generation computers were going to take over the world and it never happened um and so i think that fears of artificial intelligence are greatly exaggerated because i think artificial intelligence is very limited it can do very impressively things like play chess or go or do facial recognitions uh, but it's not conscious and it's not real intelligence. Um, and there's no way digital computers could ever exhibit true intelligence consciousness, uh, in, in my opinion. That's why I think if one wanted to look for that in the computer world, one would have to start afresh with analog computers where because they're inherently holistic and because they can have a lot of indeterminism within them, 
are much more promising. And quantum computing, which involves a lot of probabilistic processes, uh, is in a sense reinventing analog computing. So I would say if anything of this is going to happen, it's much more likely to emerge from quantum or analog computing than from existing digital computing systems. Hmm. There's a there's a really interesting project out of Australia called Cortical Labs, where what they've done is they have designed a biological computer interface. And so they print an electrode that has a sensing area and a stimulating area, and then they grow neurons on top of it, and then they connect those neurons to a computer program, and they can teach them to do stuff. And so they were able to, I think in like three or four passes of an experiment, they were able to teach them how to play Pong simply by, do you know Carl Friston's free energy principle? Yes. So they work with Carl Friston and they harnessed his idea that what uh, cells want to do is they want to minimize uncertainty. And so when they perform incorrectly, they give them an uncertain condition. <coughs> when they perform correctly, they give them a predictable stimulus. And using that principle, they're able to train them to do stuff. And what's really interesting is that the human neurons in a dish outperform mouse neurons at this computer game task. And that, to me, is a morphic phenomenon because you take these cells out of the context of a brain, out of the context of historical knowledge of what it means to play Pong, and yet you're taking them from a brain that has grown up in a world where it knows how to play Pong. By the way, unpublished result, the, the editors made them take that statement out of their discussion, even though they found it to be true, which is fascinating. Well, they, they made them take out the statement that human neurons are better than mouse right, neurons right, at right. learning because the, uh, the, the question is open. And we, we had the guy who, who's the lead scientist on the project on the show. Uh, the question is open whether or not you can design an experiment where you train the neurons on something that mice are really good at, like a smell-based game. Well, it's fascinating. Um, it'd be very interesting to know quite how the neurons are doing it, because obviously, the, if there's a pattern emerging, they must be working holistically. It's not just a single nerve cell with on-off switches. They're working together. And typically, patterns of neurons or even heart cells uh, cultivated in dishes have rhythmic processes. You know, a lot of neuronal cultures will have a rhythmic firing pattern waves of activity and like if you grow heart uh, muscle cells in tissue culture when they form clumps they'll start pulsing like a heart there's inherent rhythmic nature to these holistic assemblies and um, i think morphic resonance works on systems that are literally resonant i.e that they're rhythmic it's so it's possible that these systems that they've got in australia that you just described um, would even undergo morphic resonance learning effects. It's possible you could train one lot to learn it, and it may be the second time you do it, they'd learn it quicker. Um, mm. So I, I don't they probably won't be looking for morphic resonance effects because it's already fairly radical, and I'm sure that they're, um, uh, they don't want to get into extra unnecessary trouble by saying there might be morphic resonance going on here. But it would be very interesting if they tracked their experiments if they do the same thing over and over again to compare the results to see whether there's a change in the speed or the efficiency at which it happens as time goes on. Well, their goal is to make it a platform that is cheap enough for any laboratory to use. They want to be able to make this as a tool for studying systems. They're also outside of the academy too, which is kind of cool. They, they are, you know, they, I think their last paper was in Nature, but they're, they're just an institution on their own, which is pretty, I think, forward thinking. Well, it's almost necessary if they're doing something really radical, probably. I mean, they might not be able to do it within a standard lab. But if they do indeed intend to make this widely accessible, and, and uh, if they succeed, then this could easily become a, a platform for morphic resonance experiments. Mm. You know, And there would be a case where uh, you could buy a system that had been pre-trained in their lab to do these things much quicker than it might otherwise do because it's already sort of morphic resonance conditioned mm -hmm. um so um that would be very fascinating mm. have you had the chance to sit down with any scientists that are working 
within the institutions at present? Like, have, have you had a conversation with Michael Levin or uh, w- with anybody who's, you know, squarely seated within the institution about these things publicly? Or? Well, yes. I mean, Michael Levin and I have been in touch. We correspond and, you know, I visited him at Tufts University and, you know, we know we, he's read some of my books and so on. Yes, um, and we're in contact on a, I wouldn't say very regular basis, but, you know, I think last time was a few weeks ago. Um, mm-hmm. I had a long Zoom call last night with a scientist in Oxford who's working on epigenetic effects in nematode worms, and um, we were discussing potential experiments. Um I do, um, I've done um, a series of some podcasts with uh, a Spanish neuroscientist, young neuroscientist, Dr. Alex Gomez Marin. In fact, one of ours is on YouTube, on my YouTube channel called Our Memories Stored in Brains. Um, and he's working in a mainstream neuroscience institute. And and we're exploring together, um, you know, the question of how memory works. I think it works by morphic resonance. I don't think it's stored in brains. Um, and of course, the majority conventional opinion is, yes, of course, it's stored in brains. Where else could it be? Um, anyway, so uh, Alex Gomez Marin and I, um, uh, you know, have an ongoing series of discussions and we're working together on some scientific papers. Um, one of them is going to appear in a journal fairly soon. Um so yes, I, I mean I interact quite a lot with people within institutional science. Um but the uh, this is usually on a private level, you know. I'm I'm I the, I have plenty of friends within the scientific world. Um and uh, but I don't ask them to come out in public and support what I'm doing because I know it would damage their position because I'm dangerous to know. Um, but, you know, privately, we have all sorts of, you know, very agreeable conversations, quite wide ranging and so on. Mm-hmm. This, it's not as if everyone in the scientific world actually believes in mechanistic materialism. I would say it's a minority. We did surveys here in Britain of practicing scientists, engineers, and medical professionals in Britain, France, and Germany. Um, and it turned out the number who are actual sort of hardcore atheistic materialists is fairly high. It's about 25%. And then another 20% were sort of less committed, but would say they were agnostic or non-religious or generally speaking, went along with the sort of mechanistic approach. But that's 45%. Another 45% described themselves as spiritual and or religious. Um and so the, the, the number of sort of hardcore mechanistic materialistic atheists is probably about 25%. And that's what the survey showed. And it's what my own um, experience shows, because whenever I give talks in scientific institutions afterwards, I always have people coming up to me who look one way or the other to see if anyone's listening and, and say, you know, I've had these kinds of experiences or my dog knows when I'm coming home from the lab or I've had these telepathic things I can't understand or I'm really interested in morphic resonance, but I can't tell my colleagues. Uh, they always say that. And sometimes when four or five people in the same institution have told me the same thing, I said, well, actually, I happen to know that four or five of your colleagues share this kind of interest. They say, how do you know? And I said, because they just told me. And I sometimes introduce them to each other. So they're in the closet. It's a bit like gays in the 1950s, you know, they, they're pretending to be straight. Um, um, and so I don't think the whole scientific world is full of people who are totally committed to the, that worldview. I think they pretend to believe in it during working hours because it's good for their career. And I know that I worked for seven years in India. I worked in an international agricultural institute. And many of my colleagues there were uh, Indian. And among my Indian colleagues, there were no atheists. I didn't, I, I met only one. He wasn't in my institute. He was in another institute. He'd done a PhD in Cambridge. But of the ones I worked with and knew best, um, at work, they went along with the mechanistic worldview, plant breeding, it's just genes and, you know, molecular biology and so on. 
But in the evenings, when they invited me to their homes, you know, they, if they were Hindus, they'd have their shrines and Ganesh, and their wives would be lighting joysticks and doing pujas and things. And if they were Muslims, they'd fast in Ramadan and do their daily prayers and so forth. Um, if they were Christians, they you know, were quite, most of them quite devout Christians. And uh, so they didn't have an atheistic, mechanistic worldview as soon as they left the lab. It was like an emulsion. Uh, their lives were like an emulsion of sort of Western mechanistic science at work. But what really mattered in their private lives wasn't like that at all. And that's true of many scientists too. Um, I mean, lots of scientists, uh, practicing scientists, are interested in more holistic worldviews. Many of them take psychedelics and have mind-blowing experiences. Uh, many, uh, you know, meditate or have other spiritual practices quite a lot of religious. Um, so I think that the present state of mechanistic science is rather like communism in the Soviet Union under Brezhnev, when, you know, if you were a dissident from the communist materialist worldview, you got locked up in a psychiatric institution. So, and some people were brave enough to be publicly dissident, and they were locked up in psychiatric institutions, better than under Stalin, where they would have just been shot or sent to Siberia. It was a more humane approach. Um, but most people didn't want to be locked up in psychiatric institutions. So they, in public, pretended to go along with this worldview. You know, when the, at the party congress, people made speeches in favor of Marxism, Leninism, etc., they'd clap dutifully and so on. But when the Soviet Union collapsed, when communism was no longer the official ideology, um, how many people really believed in it? There were some, but it certainly wasn't everyone. Uh, but before the collapse of the Soviet Union, most people were pretending to believe in it. And I think it's like that within science. I think that it's, it isn't as if most scientists have this dogmatically mechanist, materialist worldview or deeply committed to it. It's just the way you keep your job and the way you keep in with your colleagues, and it's the shared worldview that's important for the community to believe in, et cetera, or appear to believe in. Um, but it doesn't go that deep in, in many people because they I have mean, other experiences which go beyond it. Well, it's kind of, your, your career is kind of remarkable in that you have actually managed to reach a lot of minds and you've really been successful as a heretic actually and that seems kind of uncommon like we meet people all the time on the fringes of science with ideas and they seem utterly incapable of bringing those ideas into a public discussion and and that I, often leads to an incredible amount of bitterness and that's something that I was about uh, that I was going to ask about because you don't seem I bitter I just want to know what your secret to success has been because you're you, I mean Success, what I mean by success is your ability to really make these ideas live in the world despite how utterly heretical they are and all of the institutional scientists, or not, not all of them, but many uh, large institutions taking shots at your work. And it's just kind of incredible that you've pr prevailed through that. Is, is there some secret to your success? <laughs> because I would love to learn it. Oh. Well, I think partly it's not taking it personally. Um, the thing is that this is a worldview, and I'm putting forward a different way of looking at things, um, which causes this immune response. And so I don't think it's me personally that they, I mean, I, many people find me irritating and annoying and stuff for doing what I do, but it's, it's primarily, um, there, most people who attack me, genuinely believe that they're fighting for the truth and that they genuinely believe in this mechanistic worldview. That's the militant atheists and mechanists. Most people don't attack me like that. The ones who attack me are nearly all these militant types, um, you know, evangelical atheists, P.Z. Myers, um, Jerry Coyne, Richard Dawkins, you know, people like that. Um, Many regular scientists don't have this extremist view, as I said earlier. Um, so, first of all, not take it too personally. And secondly, um, not feel resentful. I mean, this is, I'm a practicing Christian. I'm an Anglican and Episcopalian in American terms. And, you know, every day I pray. And um, 
I pray, well, I always start with the Lord's Prayer. And when I get to the bit, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. Um, if somebody has made some unfair attack on my work, that's definitely a trespass. Um, and um, I try to, I pray for the grace to let go of it, not to be bitter and resentful and angry, because that's it's partly for self-protection. If I became bitter, angry and resentful, is these things are emotions are corrosive to one's own psyche. I don't want to be corroded by bitterness, anger and resentment. So I prefer to try and uh, through with the help of prayer and I would put it in the help of divine grace as well. But, you know, the, the forgiving power that comes through prayer um, that I, I try and go to bed every night without feeling angry about anything. I mean, I do feel angry about all sorts of things in the world, but not at a kind of personal resentful nagging level and this has got easier over the years it wasn't very easy to start with when i was attacked really viciously uh who in, in people who wanted to destroy me i mean destroy my career but actually really wanted to destroy me as well um and uh but you know i saw that they were by their lights fighting for what they thought of as truth and they saw me as a uh, as, a, as a heretic who was undermining the entire scientific enterprise and were, if allowed to persist unchecked would unleash what Freud called the black mud of superstition that would overwhelm science and civilization as we know them and that's how these organized groups of skeptics see themselves to this day um, but you know they're they're on a kind of crusade but um realizing that's what they're doing and why they're doing it makes it easier not to feel tremendously resentful or angry or bitter mm. gosh that's so that's so inspirational i i really personally could learn a lot of that i i, I suffer so much from people's uh you know utter personal attacks you know especially when you introduce a new idea to someone it's just it really gets at my lizard amygdala brain and, and i just feel very defensive but i think just cultivating a sense of empathy for people really wanting to do the right thing is man that's that's really something to aspire to yeah do you think that there's utility in engaging the harshest critics or is there much more utility in turning to the people who are already supportive of the ideas I think there's certainly a utility in engaging with people who are moderately open-minded, but who've been educated in the conventional way. If you're dealing with the harshest critics, people like Richard Dawkins and stuff, then there's not much point. I've had encounters with almost all the top skeptics and militant atheists. Um, and the most extreme ones like Dawkins simply aren't interested in the evidence. They know they're right. They're on a crusade um and there's there's simply no they won't engage um they except their only response is dismissive you know that's rubbish it's stupid it's ignorant it's foolish or something like that and i mean for example last year stephen pinker who's one of these militant materialists um wrote a book called rationality in which he argues that psychic phenomena and other unexplained phenomena don't exist uh, because they're impossible and therefore there's no need it's it's rational not to pay any attention to the evidence because you know in advance that all the evidence is false fraudulent foolish or whatever it's invalid um so i challenged him to a debate about telepathy uh, through a british blog called unheard which has a fairly wide following. And if I just emailed him privately, I'm sure he would have ignored it. But a public challenge would be much harder for him to deal with. Um, and he tried to ignore it. But in the end, he was forced to respond. And then he said he hadn't got, as he put it, the bandwidth to do this uh, debate. Um, and on further questioning, it turned out by that he meant that if he were to enter a debate about these things, he'd actually have to spend some time looking at the evidence. And he hadn't got time to do that and didn't want to waste time doing that. So, I mean, it's an impermeable position, you see. It's evidence-free, 
based on pure dogma. Um, and when you're dealing, it's it's like trying to argue with a creationist about evolution. If you meet somebody who's completely committed to an ideological point of view, they're very defended. Or, or you know, arguing with a conspiracy theorist who's totally committed to their particular conspiracy theory. Uh, it's like that. And I find it's, a, I mean, I do it when it, when I'm asked to do it. If, I, if I'm invited to do a debates with people like that, I do it. Um, but most of them would rather avoid having to enter into these debates. Um, but with more open-minded scientists, you know, people who have been educated in the conventional way, who haven't thought about these other alternatives, then it's a, it's more fruitful to have a discussion and to, you know, raise points that might open new possibilities in, in their thinking or in thinking together. Um, so, yes, I do do that as much as I can, in fact. It's fascinating how there's just no component of socialization in science education. Like when you come through grad school, it's just, you know, crushing ideas and, you know, consuming knowledge. And there's just no pause to consider how dialogue should actually unfold. And I would love to see Science 2.0 exhibit some features of that in its education pipelines. Yeah. If you if you could have a a dream debate, who would you debate that you haven't spoken to yet? I think probably um, if it if it's going to be with someone who's has quite opposing views, I think the only militant atheist I haven't yet had a debate with is Sam Harris, mm. and Sam Harris is quite interesting because uh, he is a deeply committed atheist. You know, he's sort of a fire-breathing anti-religious atheist. On the other hand, he meditates and, um, in fact, gives online meditation courses. And his wife um, is, you know, is is a Buddhist meditator and uh, is interested in panpsychism. So Sam Harris is someone who's part of him is in that kind of hardcore mechanistic materialist world and part of him isn't and um i dare say confronted with me he'd flip back into defensively into his hardcore persona but there's parts of him which are opening i mean i watched a podcast of his fairly recently where he was talking about a mushroom trip he'd done a psilocybin trip and he said where he had this incredible unity of experience he felt he was part of a consciousness far greater than his own and stuff and he could understand if he'd been a christian mystic how he would have identified this with god and how it would have seemed completely persuasive and uh, that was his own experience but after a few days reflection he realized that this was nothing but changes inside the brain uh, caused by the chemicals of the psilocybin etc so he's he sort of I mean, my point is that science is meant to be empirical. Empirical means about experience. If you have an experience like that, the experience itself is self-validated. It's an experience. Um, but then he interpreted the experience in terms of an ideology or a theory, the mechanistic theory, the mind's nothing but the brain, and then devalued his own experience because he prioritized a theory over experience. And I think that the whole point of science is should try to prioritize experience over theory. That's the basis of the empirical method. Um, so, you know, I'd be quite interested if he was open to discussing it, but he might not be. I just don't mm. know. That's that's something I would love to work towards yeah, making happen. Will, that, would, will, that would be pretty incredible. We'll start working on that. He's a hard one to reach, but you never know. You never know. I, like, I, just, I really wonder with super militant atheists, if you couldn't offer a new definition of God that would allow them to soften their positions because... They're allergic to the superstition, right? They're allergic to the superstition. <clears throat> and, and yet we have a sense that there's an emergent property of all things together. And I'm not sure why that can't be God. Like Shiloh and I would have these conversations where I was very, I was very adamant about the fact that I didn't believe in God. I grew up in a Soviet family. There was, you know, we were Jewish. Like we went to high holidays to temple, maybe, I don't know, like, 
three or four times over the course of my entire life. We would light the Hanukkah candles. My dad would say the prayer. But I, I was very against the idea of an external being. And then we, over the course of many years, over many discussions, I would, I would lay out my vision of, of nature and the interconnectedness of everything and the way that we are shaped by the things around us and we shape them and there's this pressure upon us where there is indeterminism and yet there is, there is some fatedness. And Shiloh would very quietly be like, I think that's God. And I was very against that for a long time. And then we had Don Hoffman on the show. And Don Hoffman kind of has this conscious agent story of God, where you have everything as it sums together, producing progressively larger and larger conscious agents until everything sums into the final ultimate conscious agent. And his father was, uh, I think he was a Lutheran minister. And when I found that out, all of a sudden everything clicked into place and I was able to conceptualize the the universe, which is all things in existence, as God. Therefore, all of us are a part of something. And it just, it made a lot of sense. And I wonder when I speak to atheists, if that isn't, if that isn't something that they themselves already feel, but they just don't have the right words for it, and the word God is, is something that they're allergic to. Yeah, I think it's largely an allergy. Um, um, and many of them, after all, believe that there's some unifying principle of everything, they, the universe and the laws of nature and, and the whole of nature, they think of as a kind of unity, um, which has a coherence and an order within it. Um, they usually think of it as unconscious, but that's um, that's really a product of mechanistic materialist ideology since the 17th century. And I mean, it's a deep habit. Um, but I think what opens up many people who are materialist is is direct experiences of mystical type experiences and in the modern world that's usually through psychedelics um in the past it would have been through you know spiritual practices like fasting and so on but now many millions of people experience these altered states of consciousness through psychedelics and i think there's a twofold problem i think one is that um their prejudice and allergy to God is based usually on a, a very peculiar one-sided view of God. I mean, they they think of God as being someone who creationists in the deep south worship and uh, and part of the religious right or something. I mean, there's all sorts of reasons to be against that kind of God or belief system for many people. Um, but um, I think it's also the case that religious people um, since the 17th century have retreated into a view of god that sort of separates god from nature because science has got nature and they've just got god and so it's not really related to nature and for many religious practitioners uh, in the middle ages you see people would go to holy springs holy wells holy mountains pilgrimages through the fields it was very nature related and gothic cathedrals are full of carve of foliage and green men and you know vegetation spirits and so forth it was very animistic but when nature and, and religion were separated in the 17th century all of those experiences were shifted away from god and into science or uh, and then in science they were devalued devalued because conscious experiences of no value in a materialist world is just an illusion or epiphenomenon of the brain so I think there also has to be a recovery within the religious traditions of a much richer view of God than the one they've been used to for the last few centuries. And there are theologians, and Matthew Fox is one who's a friend of mine, and we've done a couple of books together, um, an American theologian who has a very much um, you know, God-pervaded view of nature. Uh, another one is David Bentley Hart, who's an American theologian, whose book, The Experience of God Being Consciousness Bliss, is, I think, a, a book that shows how theology correctly understood, uh, understood in terms of its long tradition of reflection on the nature of consciousness, has something to tell us about the very nature of consciousness itself, because God is primarily consciousness. And um, so experienced directly through mystical experiences, um, 
And the idea that there's a consciousness within and beyond the universe underlying and permeating all things is the traditional view of God, not as some separate external being out there. Mm. Um, and so David Bentley Hart makes it very clear that not only in the Christian tradition, but also in aspects of Judaism, Sufism in Islam, Hinduism, and, and, and in parts of the Buddhist tradition, uh, there's much more in common than separates uh, them. And what they have in common is a threefold version of the understanding of ultimate consciousness. There's a ground of being, which Hindus call sat. Then there's the contents of consciousness, which Hindus call chit, the, the knower and the known. Um, and then there's a principle of energy, power, movement, change, which is the Holy Spirit. Um, and those are all there, even in the Jewish tradition, right in the book, first chapter of the book of Genesis. You know, uh, the Spirit of God moved on the face of the deep, verse 2. Um, the Spirit of God is like the wind, pneuma or ruach in, in Hebrew is, is wind, power, breath. And the Spirit of God moving on the face of the deep, or the ocean or the primal ocean, creates waves. So you have a kind of vibratory picture of God's action. And then God said, let there be light. So you have the spoken word, the, 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 um, which has form, substance, meaning, connection, um, which in the Christian Holy Trinity, the spirit and, and the word are the two aspects through which God is, works and is revealed in the world. And, uh, and it's right there. I mean, Jewish people don't believe in the Holy Trinity because they think it's three gods and not one God and so on. But, um, Actually, um, when one sees that the word and the spirit of God are aspects of the divine or attributes or ways in which the divine acts in the world and in nature and through nature, one can see it even there in, in, in the Jewish Old Testament. So what David Bentley Hart shows in his book, The Experience of God, Being, Consciousness, Bliss, is that a deep theology common to the world's major traditions actually gives one a a much deeper and richer understanding of nature and indeed of our own consciousness because it's part of that greater consciousness. Hmm. Oh, gosh, and with well, that, I'm afraid I'm going to have to leave you because it's dinner time and I'm already late for um, dinner. So, uh, well, I mean, we could have a, a minute or two more, but I'm going to have to go, I'm afraid. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for giving us so much of your time. Uh, I've learned so much and I'm very inspired. Yeah, to, I'm, to, I'm inspired to do better too and, and mm. just to, you know, approach these subjects uh, and, and approach my enemies uh, in a better light uh, with a more productive mindset and empathetic. And yeah, thank you so much for coming by. It was really well, wonderful. My pleasure and keep up your good work. I'm so glad you're doing this. Thank you.